Also, Good morning, everybody. West Road. I'd like to call the Finance and Opportunity Meeting to order. Our clerk today will be Sheila Gurry. I'd like to welcome you. It's the June 26th meeting. Recognize first that we are on the traditional territory of the same First Nation. Uh, the question period shine, sign up sheet is on the desk next to the reporting secretary. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down their name and the agenda item. At the start of question period, I'll call up those who have signed up uh, on, to the podium to address council. And the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. Ms. Gurley, I understand you don't have any at this point. That's correct, Your Worship. Uh, so a motion for the approval of the agenda. Councillor Hemmins, second Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Mr. Carries, thank you. Uh, the minutes have been circulated. A motion for adoption of the minutes. Councillor Brown, second Councillor uh, Bonner. All those in favor? Motion carries, thank you. Mr. Sir, you're the star today. Thank you, you're with Good morning. Okay. 
So now that we have completed the 2019 to 2023 business plan and it's been adopted, we are starting the budget process for the 2020 to 2024 budget cycle. So at today's workshop, um, Ms. Fuller will take you through an overview of the financial planning process, um, go through the budget timeline, and a review of where we're starting at with this budget. So the, 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 this budget assumes current service levels and um, does not need any additional service level increases at this stage. So once she is done her presentation, we will have a discussion with Council about what direction, if any, you would like to see in this budget cycle, um, what your expected outcomes are. So we'll do that at the end once we've gone through everything. So I will hand it over to Ms. Fuller and she will go through the presentation. Thank you. Ms. Fuller, good morning. Good morning. So I just want to talk a little bit about the financial planning process. So, of course, our planning framework is composed of separate but complementary planning processes. So, of course, we have our asset management plan, which is our long term infrastructure planning. And, of course, that feeds into that 20 year investment plan that we did and also into our 10 year project plan. Then we also have corporate planning documents and master plans. So, these are such things as our OCP, our parks, recreation, and culture plan, as well as our transportation master plan. So, we have a number of different plans that Council has adopted, and they also feed into our financial plan. Then, of course, we have our departmental business plans. So these are the work plans or roadmaps of how departments are going to achieve Council's goals. And then we have our five-year financial plan that, of course, you adopt each year. And then overarching all of that is Council's strategic plan. So these, of course, are the goals and priorities that you as Council have set for the city, and that plays into everything that we do in our planning process. So in our financial plan, there's really three main we have our operating budgets, we have our projects, and we have our business cases. Now, of course, underlying our operating budgets is those departmental business plans. They'll be reviewed and revised annually so that they remain current and responsive to emerging issues, challenges, and also the changing conditions. And they support those operating budgets that are requested by departments. So our operating budgets are the money we need each year to do our day-to-day -day services. So that's mowing our parks, processing our development permits, powering our streets, keeping our pools open. They are sometimes referred to as our base budgets, and we use a modified zero base budgeting approach, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. And we do five-year operating budgets. On the project side, we do 10-year project planning, so each year we're updating our 10-year project plan. So this is infrastructure projects, projects that we need for growth, as well as strategic projects that move forward with priorities of council. And we believe some projects is either an operating project or a capital project, and that's really just based on our capital expenditure policy. Um, it's an accounting distinction, so nothing to get caught up with. And then, of course, we have business cases. So business cases, they support new resources or changes to service levels or changes to how we're going to provide services to the city. For example, we did the business case for when we looked at automating our garbage system. We also did the business case for the replacement of fire station number one. So looking a little more in depth to those three categories, for operating budgets, operating budgets are based on maintaining current service levels. We do what we call a zero, modified zero base budget. So what that means is managers basically start with no budget. When they sit down with their financial analyst, the only budget they have is for approved staffing and of course some internal charges. So if you have computers in your department, if you have a photocopier, or if you have a city fleet vehicle. Otherwise, you're building your budget from the ground up. So you're looking at, you're reviewing your staffing plans, you're reviewing the work schedules, you're looking at those resources and you take a commit in the departmental business plan and you're going line by line through your budget, looking at current costs, looking at your contracts, everything. So it's not simply a matter of we roll the budget over and add 2%. We're actually reviewing every single line item in the budget. For project planning, here we do roll over our 10 plan and now we're updating our plan. So we're looking at new conditions, assessment information we have, new maintenance information that's come forward. We're identifying new projects that may come up during the year. We're updating projects 
changes, for scope changes, for time changes, for cost estimate changes, and we're also adding projects that may have been identified through the year to move forward strategic for or direction from the council. And of course, we look at business cases where appropriate, as I said in fire station number one, that project was supported by a business case. And we also do cost benefit analysis. For example, any project funded from the sustainability user has a payback analysis done to make sure that it meets our criteria for being funded from that And then we have business cases. So again, these are for both internal management purposes, but they also support this decision making. And sometimes the business cases come to council to help them in their decision making. So a business case is really is going to look at what is the business issue, what are some of the options for dealing with that issue, what are expected outcomes. And we look at both quantitative and qualitative characteristics. The business case isn't all just about the financials, because there's other non-financial benefits to do different services or um, moving forward on a project. So basically some of the key points I want to make here is our business plan are aligned with our strategic plan and they support our operating budgets. Operating budgets are based on maintaining current service levels unless we receive other direction. And any new enhanced or changes to service levels are supported by a business case. Our projects work within our existing funding strategies. Our projects look at renewal of existing resources, resources needed for growth, as well as those strategic priorities that come out of our different master plans. So looking at the timeline, we laugh that we're talking about the budget already. We pretty well work on the budget 12 months of the year. Some months we're working on multiple years of the budget. So back in February, while you were still focused on this year's financial plan, staff was already moving forward on updating the tender project plan for the upcoming year. They worked on that plan all through the spring, and in June now, scope sheets are due to financial planning, and we're just wrapping up our project planning right now to pull together our draft project plan. In June, finance is also busy in rolling in all the budgeting software and preparing it for the upcoming budget cycle. And of course, we come to Council in June asking for some direction on your priorities and the expectations of what you're looking to see in the draft financial plan that we'll bring back to the fall. In July, managers meet one-on-one -on -one with their financial analysts to develop their operating budgets. They begin working on updating their business plans, and we also start working on first drafts of business cases. In August, everything comes to a head. Operating budgets are due, draft of the department business plans are due to finance, and we wrap up our business cases. Then in September, the senior management team will review business cases, and our department starts our review of the budget. So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on, a lot of entries we have to make for debt, internal charges, often a lot of fun accounting stuff that we get to do to make the budget balance. And we also begin our analysis of the budget and preparing documentation that can then be presented to you in November. In October, the senior management team reviews the budget and we tweaks before we bring it back to you. And then of course in November and early December you'll get presentations on department's 2020 business plans. You'll also get a five-year project highlight and that's where we'll see further direction from the council on changes you might wish to make to the draft budget to bring us to the provisional budget. We also do further public consultation in December. Usually that takes the form of an A-Town Hall. In December, we will also have to adopt our use rates for sewer, water, and garbage as those come into effect on January 1st. And we target by the end of the year that we will have had first two days of the provisional budget and with adoption in early January. And then in March and April, we'll come back to you with changes for the budget between provisional and final. Some of those will be changes that were directed by council. Some will be updates to estimates because, of course, we need one provisional budget. We still have estimates for some of our numbers. And some other changes are also <coughs> And then, of course, by May 15, we have to adopt that property tax bylaw as well as our final budget or our amended financial plan. So looking at where we're starting, our 2019-2023 financial plan in May, it had year two of budget, starting at a 3.6 property tax increase, so that was 1% for asset management 
and 2.6 percent for general property tax increase. Now, a couple things to keep in mind here. This was based on the budget you approved in May, so any additional changes that have been discussed or directed by council are not reflected in that number. And you also have to keep in mind that staff is now going to go back, as I said, and go line by line through their operating budget, their adjusting estimates. So this is just a starting point. It will likely change from that when we bring you a draft budget. When we look at projected user fee increases, we'll have a 4% increase for sanitary sewer, and of course that's our uh, increase for the asset management reserve, and that continues on till 2022. In water, we have a 7.5% increase, so that's 2.5% goes to our asset management reserve, and a 5% general increase. I'd also like to mention we are doing a sewer and water user fee review, and staff anticipates coming back in the fall to council with the results of that user rate review. And then right now we're projecting sanitation use of fees to be $171. So keeping in mind we approved an initial group starting in 2020, so that truck is on order and will be here for 2020. And then of course we're having to add a refuse collector to drive that truck in 2020. And of course the sanitation manager will be going through their budget, updating estimates, because of course we have estimates for what tipping fees and different things will be. So that rate could change once we update all of our budget information. So what are the key drivers that got us to that 3.6%? Well, we have just under a million dollars for a 1% annual increase to our asset management reserve. We have an increase in project expenditures. I can't read it from the same quote. 400. 409. So that is a change. In 2019, project funding was approximately 6.97 million, and it moves to 7.4 million in 2020. So as you recall, in our 20-year investment plan, we do target about $7 million a year for project funding. We have an increase to the RCMP contract of about $1.6 million. So we have our three new officers starting in April 1st, 2020, the 15 officers that you have approved adding. And we've also changed in 2019, we're budgeting the contract at 92%. At this point, we're budgeting the 2020 contract at 93%. You also have to keep in mind this is based on the estimate we received last year from the RCMP. They sent us in updated costing estimates, so that number will be updated based on the new information that we get from the RCMP. Uh, Ms. Ms. Phillip, if I may interrupt, um, yes. thank you very much for what you've done so far. It's pretty impressive, but I, I just want to sort of remind Council that we're looking at the key budget drivers. And all we're looking at really is uh, those things that are sort of necessary and important and practical. So what I what council will be thinking about obviously is that uh, if you look at the timelines and outline this morning, staff realistically is looking at June for us to make decisions around what we think might be other priorities that would have a budgetary impact. So I just like everyone to keep that in the back of their minds. I don't want to sound patronizing as I say this, but there's the basics, let alone anything else you want to do. Then we have the strategic infrastructure reserve. So originally we were looking at a four-year transition of the Fortis Gas and the Casino revenue over to our strategic infrastructure reserve. In December, you made the decision to extend that to five years, so there was no increase to the transfer to the strategic infrastructure reserve for 2019. So 2020 will be year four of our five-year transition, so that's a $400,000 impact. And then we have other changes that net out to $1.6 million, so that's changes to wages and benefits, it's revenue increases, expenditure uh, increases, decreases, it all just nets out. We don't go into that fine detail at this point. Councillor Armstrong. Does that include the four new uh, fire prevention, or not prevention? Fire 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 okay. Yes, the they were approved as part of the 2019 2020 financial plan, so they are Thank you. So that gives us a net expenditure increase of about $5 million. From that, we take out the increase, projected property tax increase due to growth, and at this point, we're conservative and we use $1.2 million. And of course, eventually, we'll upgrade that to the final number, but we started out conservative. So that gives us an impact of about $3.8 million, which brings us up to our 3.6 projected property tax increase. So a few things to keep in mind. We did apply for that grant for the expansion of the Port Theatre. The city's contribution, if the grant is successful, is $4.6 million. We were looking at short-term borrowing of $4.5 million for 
large portion of our 4.6, with 100,000 coming from the strategic interest for the user. So if we are successful in that grant application, which we probably won't know until later this fall, or it could even be early 2020, that will have a 1% impact on taxes. Now that 1% will be spread over multiple years, because it's a multi-year project, so we will, of course, stage the borrowing to um, reflect our cash flow needs. At this point, it's impossible to project that, because we don't know when the grant will be approved, so we don't know when the project will start. So we don't have accurate cash flow estimates. And of course, this is contingent on the grant being approved. But this is something to keep in mind that if we are successful, there is another 1% property tax increase can will be spread out over at least a couple of years. The other thing that can also not include is whatever comes up your economic development strategy. So if you want to add a budget for that, that is not currently reflected. So basically today we're looking for some direction from council. What are your expected outcomes from the draft budget that we're going to you? What your short term goals and priorities are. And we also want to introduce some things like at the governance and our priorities committee, um, we had a presentation on road rehabilitation. So we're also looking, are you asking staff to reprioritize programs within existing funding envelopes or are you looking at that you might potentially want to increase project funding from general revenue to expand some of these programs that staff have been presenting to you at the GPC? Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Mercer and Ms. Perudo because I'm sure they would like to add some comments. Thank you very much. Ms. Mercer. I don't have too much other to add, but the, this is the time for discussion for council to say if you have some priorities that you would like us to, we've assumed, like I said, a status quo service level. If there's anything that you want us to change within that, now is the time, because it's easier now than later to, um, at the beginning of the process rather than at the end. Councilor Palmer, then Councilor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, who sets the business plans and case studies? Um, because I have some um, serious concerns about, or serious suggestions about revamping bylaws and how we do that in the city. Um, but I'm not, um, you're asking for council direction in June, and it's June 26 today, and this is probably the only meeting we're going to have this month. I'm kind of caught up a little bit off guard. Like, I have a whole bunch of, and I think other councillors do as well, um, about expectations of things we'd like to change. Um, I'm not really keen on the status quo. Um, so, um, who, when the business plans come to us, who makes those decisions, and how much impact do we have? on that before it comes to us so that it comes to us in something we could probably agree to. Great. So the normal process for the business plan, business cases are, so for new service levels or changes in serve, how we do service, those come through the senior leadership team and they um, are vetted at that stage. But they also get included into the business plans that get presented to council. So that's been our process in the past, um, and if there is something that council would like to see, if there's something you would like to see, give us that input now, and we can and work on making sure that those processes. I'm going to let Mr. Rudolph speak before I go to you, Your Worship. I think it's a very valid question, and firstly, I'll say this is there could be more workshop uh, discussion opportunities over the course of July, for example, if council wishes to do that. So let's say after come up with everything today, but the process is, we're talking about two things, we're talking about business plans and business cases. Business cases are for an enhanced or a different level of service on a certain area. Uh, so the ones that you, that you receive, would receive uh, from staff are staff driven. If council has an ask or a desire to pursue a certain type of thing or a change, we can explore that and come back to you with a, a discussion on a business case or something like that. So there's an opportunity to start to to do that. Uh, so the business plans are really a documentation of the services and the portfolio of responsibilities in each of the units. And it's, you know, this is what we do, this is our assets, this is the recent history, this is the projected needs and requirements to sustain that level of service. And, uh, and then some, some of the departments will put forward uh, asks in the form of business cases for enhanced resources or or monies to for various projects because they feel from a staffing point of view they're necessary. Some of the internal departments would have, for example, issues around software and things that make the business systems more effective. Uh, so uh, 
yeah, so I, I, I think there's a, there's a discussion that needs to be warranted in terms of what, what is a council in addition to what's in your strategic plan and what's in our work plan now, how do you, what, what would you like us to explore? There's only so much capacity that we have and, um, and what would it take to do that? Or is it just a reallocation of existing resources to do something different? So, Maybe that's going to take a little while to walk through. I'm not sure. But, uh, just, you know, we're here early. It's still early in the process. And you really won't see the budgets again, ultimately, until later in the fall. So I wouldn't feel like we feel that it has to be all today to take a little discussion. Councillor Thorpe and Councillor Hemmings, Councillor Armstrong, and Councillor Reservoir. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mercer and Ms. Fuller. Um, in the presentation uh, under projects, it mentioned the 10 year planning horizon. And uh, I'm just curious to be refreshed uh, in terms of what major projects we do have on the horizon, aside from the number one fireball, which uh, I know is a huge one. Uh, and maybe that information isn't available right now, but I would appreciate uh, having that at some point. We can get that. We can get that. Um, is there any large um, public We have the waterfront walkway. I think, yeah, through the chair to Councillor Thorpe's question, I think there's the waterfront walkway, as Ms. Paula mentioned. There's uh, the number one fire hall or fire station, as the chief likes to call it. There is the potential for uh, port theater ex expansion. And then there's a number of infrastructure and, and transportation projects that is just a lot of renewal. Uh, one of the big ones that we're looking at over the next uh, couple of years is the Metro Drive uh, complete streets corridor and, and cycling corridor, so that'll complete. Wilcox access. Wilcox access, thank you. Know. The, the, these are just kind of coming off the top of our head, but I think it's appropriate to, to give you a listing of major projects uh, that are coming, coming up in the next few years. If we, if we see. Thank you, and that's, that's fine for now, but just as a follow-up, I think that would be a valuable discussion for council to have look at those projects and, and if we still see that they are priorities or if we want to rearrange them or put more money to them or not. So uh, a future discussion perhaps. Speaking for as a child of my generation, it's June and I'm thinking of summer holidays and the Eaton's catalog hasn't arrived and you're asking me to decide what I want for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and so that that's what we have to do. We're adults now. <laughs> Councillor Evans. Thank you. Great analogy. Um, I'd just like to clarify that what we're currently dealing with as far as our HR increases do not include positions that were not included in last year's budget. Okay, so we, we potentially have a bank of positions that staff have identified as supportive to the organization and to our work, and they are not they are included. Not included. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Well, I just would like to know, when, is there a timeline on when we spend that extra gas in the money? Um, there is no... From what I understand, there is no timeline on that. We have not received it yet. Um, so that's still something we have to come back to. Now. I apologize. I was being made fun of, and I did hear your question. <laughs> well, I, I want to know um, if there's a timeline on that extra gas right. infrastructure. Thank you. It was like two, two million yeah. or something like that? Or more than that? More than that. Yeah, more than three point eight. Councillor Gesselbrock and Councillor Brown and Councillor Turley. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, through you, so I think this next budget is going to be quite tight. Um, and uh, one thing that I would like to see that I, I think that we can accomplish potentially without increasing uh, taxation is, is resourcing uh, strategic initiatives. Uh, maybe some more personnel around that, you know, especially in the environmental area. Um, there's the emissions fund that we've, we've moved. Um, I think 90,000 a year is coming into that. And I think that uh, it would be important to look at how, um, yeah, we can increase coordination of that, of, of, of council strategic direction in that area between departments and, and have you know, some, some personnel that can increase capacity. And uh, so I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd like to put that out there. And I know I've been a squeaky wheel on this and I'm curious sort of what uh, council's appetite is for that as well. Um, 
and then I think um, with projects, I'm looking forward to reviewing uh, what the project list is. Uh, I, I know we, we do have that, that extra money from the, from the gas tax and, and going through and just making sure that the projects that we're focusing on are, are aligned with our, our strategic uh, plan. Councilor Brown? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Worship. But building off that, uh, I, I would support, obviously, additional firepower in the environmental section. Um, I think there's a good base amount there for someone to work with, and I would be, obviously, this would be direction from CAO if deemed necessary, but I would be supportive of converting that, uh, that already requisition into more operations to fund the position uh, that's deemed appropriate. Um, I do have a series of service changes, but I'm not sure if this is the time to lay them out, but um, I think it's uh, we're making good time this morning, and if we're not, I'll start muttering sure. or something. Okay. Um, this is the first one, and I don't know if I don't know if any of these require new sources of funding or just a reallocation of efforts or just a slight different direction. I am cognizant of what is already just on the books and the baseline. and uh, So try to really approach this year's budget without having to fund things with additional tax requisition. Um, I would like to see somehow an increase to the Partners in Parks program. Uh, the, the base funding, I, I believe it's 100K. I think that's one of the best programs that we operate in terms of community engagement, participatory budgeting and planning. Um, so I think if we can somehow make that more robust, uh, when people have ownership over the items in their neighborhood, you know, just being at the South End community, um, you see the pride those folks have in hosting an event in a park that they really help. And I'm not even sure if that was done in the Partners in Parks program, but that level of ownership over the community is wonderful. Um, in a similar vein, I would like to see a tactical urbanism program uh, piloted in the downtown that, that's similar to the Partners in Parks program. Uh, I have examples of where that's done um, elsewhere. Uh, again, it's about doing small small projects and uh, trying to do have a longer and a larger impact. Um, I think we could see that uh, similar to the partner, Partners in Parks program. You know, ideas are simple from uh, crosswalks, making them a little more colorful, um, to wayfinding signage, uh, different people's ideas. You know, we saw a, a group come forward and present some ideas for Diana Crawl Plaza um, and some different projects from downtown to be able to, to have a policy that is what is acceptable in terms of those projects and some, some seed money to, you know, it doesn't need to be a lot to see some of those programs realized. I think it's a efficient way of uh, making change in our city. Um, service changes with parks, uh, this is a discussion that we haven't had at the council table, but I would really like to see more natural play spaces and move away from the proliferation of manufactured kits. I'm not saying in every park, but uh, there's some really cool parks out there um, that are much more innovative. There's a lot of good research around how that impacts children, how they play them, um, and Again, I don't know if that's it's just a shift in philosophy and existing funds, or if it requires um, that's beyond my ability to uh, service change. I think in some places, protected bike lanes are more appropriate. Again, I don't think this is er everywhere, but if, uh, you know, I think you just need to drive by the bowlers on Esteban to see the amount of times they've been hit by a car. Um, I think it sort of builds the case that in some places, we do need to have a separation between cyclists and automobiles. So that's better for Vehicle drivers, and it's also better for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, I had one more, but I, I forgot it now. So. Very good, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my, my two questions are more revenue related. Um, we've heard from, and many of us have heard from the public that there's a challenge with uh, cost of bylaw enforcement and the fine revenue that we from that, <clears throat> and A, I, I wouldn't mind hearing whether that's actually true, because um, I don't always believe everything I hear, um, and, and if, if it is true, are there steps in place that, that can be that this revenue then can be start to produce some actual differential between costs and, and revenue? Um, and the second one is uh, more of a communication um, issue. And, 
One of the things that every time there's a, a larger development comes along, of course, we get a lot of people, a lot, some that uh, are opposed to it for usually the same reasons on every project. The one thing I would mind seeing is, is um, some average uh, definition of what the increase in tax revenue is going to be from this specific project um, so that we have another argument point that we can use um, to help keep our tax revenue down or tax taxation level down by increasing the uh, developments that, that produce uh, extra tax revenues. I don't know if that's a, a possibility or not, but I think it's something like that. Councilor Bonner. Thank you. Um, I, just a little short question, I'm not sure who would be able to answer this. Um, when we're talking about sanitation increase because of a new route, um, I'm guessing it's just a realignment of routes and then incorporating newer houses that are built. Do we charge um, a fee for new houses coming online because we're going to actually eventually need another truck in the future so that the, 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 um, the cost of, of increasing our sanitation, new trucks, new areas, new bins, is borne by more, not all, but more by the um, new houses coming online, which are in, which are constantly increased. I don't believe that there is a, a like a connection fee, if you want, like sewer water has if for a new property. There's connection fees and things like that, but for garbage, it's just there is no connection fee. Your Worship, the, uh, your Worship, the, the entire cost of the system as it as it grows and increases is borne by the entirety of the users. So it's each each there's no DCC charge for new garbage vehicles. That that may be as Ms. Mercer says a connection type fee. But and the re reason I have, I bring it up is um, all the houses typically that are coming online now that are paying taxes are not small little houses on. on down in Halbert or something like that. These are really nice houses that uh, are not cheap. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's on Northfield, right? Um, and so, uh, I felt that. <laughs> we're not building those types of houses, small houses uh, that, that are uh, more affordable. So, um, but what happens by sharing the load across the entire tax bracket, everybody, including us folks in Northfield and down in Hal Burton, are paying for this increase. Um, so I think the, I'm always um, cognizant of the people should pay based on what they can afford. Uh, so there would be, um, I don't know if it's possible or not, but I would, I would like to see if that is an option. Getting back to the case studies, um, so my understanding now is that if we want to have something new happen or something change, we're looking at a case study. Mm -hmm. So um, my question now is, to get these case studies rolling, um, I may have a, an idea on, but I'd like to see your case study, but I don't want to see staff jumping all over and creating case studies if I want it. Is that going to require a motion from uh, council to say we want a case study on this and bring it to us as part of the budget process? Your Worship, through to Councilor Bonner, I think it would be helpful. We could get nine sets of case studies asked, so I, there needs to be some council direction consensus on some of the, at least the bigger ones that, that would warrant a business case. For, uh, so ideally, it would be a yes of resolution or specific direction from the council to at least explore certain topics or whatever. Otherwise, um, I, I think it's really council direction. We've been looking for a, a council direction. This may not be something that you can do today, maybe something you want another day to kind of bash on that. But today it's getting on the table. We're just, again, this is a new council. This is a new part of the process that you didn't experience last year. You came in at the very end of that process. So this is, this is the normal process for, agenda, or for uh, budget building. And uh, we're just bringing it here to you. To, you know, so if there's, it's interesting because we were talking about service delivery which is the best part of this discussion today as opposed to how much does it costs. We need to know that as well. What is it you're trying to accomplish? And, and uh, so often we get focused on it's a budget discussion when it really is a service delivery discussion with budget attached. And we're trying to set some parameters around the budget to this exercise. So we don't go out and, and do something that's outside the scope of your comfort zone on that. So 
Uh, yes, I think to get back to the original question, I just, uh, it would be preferable if Council and Mayor needs to just, I guess, seek a, some clarity as well on how you'd like to handle it. We would think it should be Council motions or at least consensus on looking at certain things. Councilor Bonner? Thank you. One more for me. And then going back to uh, Councilor Brown's comments about bike lanes, um, I'd like to see. Um, possibly a, a business case study of being able to connect the existing bike lanes that we have. There's a there's a gap between East and uh, where I go, right? So between East Wellington and Bowen. Um, and if we can't put dividers on, on, on the road right, and we're just painting lines, you know, rumble strips would help. Right? I'm getting tired of people trying to kill me when I'm riding my bike. Um, the other problem that uh, is coming up is that um, um, the, the, the cleaning of the bike lanes needs to take place more often, right? Because all the cars are knocking all the dirt over to the side where the bikes are going, and, and it's, it's, it's an obstacle course getting down there. So if we are going to have bike lanes and they have to be safe, then they need to be clean. And um, so um, we could do that. I know they clean Northfield every week, but they have a guy go by. So I, we, I think we should get these at least done every two or three weeks. Cause all the rocks end up on the pipe lines. Councillor Kessenbar. <laughs> no, I wanted to follow up on what Councillor Bonner said about developments. Like I look at Sandstorm, and I think something we forget about when we're looking at these approvals is who's an impact on the school district, fire, policing, because the police to population ratio, so that's an increase in policing, it's increase in firemen. Uh, hospital the capacity. Is there a way that we can start looking to recoup some of that? Like I think we need to look at that from these developers because it's our taxpayer that's paying for the extra hospital. Like right now, we've got seniors sitting in our hall six to eight weeks waiting for rooms, and that's without this new development that's going to bring thousands of people. In. So I think we need to look at the capacity when we're looking at these developments. Do we have the infrastructure? And I'm not just talking city infrastructure. Like, what's our, our school district? Like, do they have to build a new school? Because these decisions we make here affect those groups. So I would like to see more conversation with those particular groups about when we're making these big decisions because that does have a huge impact on uh, our tax care. If, uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you to, um, uh, yeah, I, I think putting the motion on the floor is important. So I, I was wondering if I, I would like to move that the staff explore additional staff capacity for coordination around environmental sustainability initiatives using the funding connected uh, or going to the emissions reduction. Seconded, Councillor Brown. Councillor Thorpe. I would like to Councillor Brown to speak first. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, given uh, our strategic uh, direction around uh, climate action and environmental sustainability, um, I think coordination, uh, additional support around um, coordination of the update of the Community Sustainability Action Plan, uh, that along with the official community plan, um, and then added support in interdepartmental coordination um, along with the new um, slated environment committee that there is there is good case and merit for additional uh, staff support in that area and I, I would just really like that to be explored and to see if something uh, creative and, and useful if it, if it is necessary uh, that we could come up with and um, I I'm open to it being uh, quite a uh, yeah, potentially diverse position. I know that there's uh, needed support potentially um, with economic development and, and environment and also support potentially for uh, the CAO. So it doesn't have to be a pigeonhole position, but uh, we'd like uh, yeah, some thoughts to that. Thank you, Your Worship. So just a moment ago, we had Mr. Rudolph comment that it would be useful uh, before we tasked staff to investigate business cases to have council uh, have a have a consensus and a brainstorming session and a workshop uh, on these different ideas so I certainly didn't come here this morning 
prepared to jump at a, at a motion that's suddenly thrown on the table and no disrespect. And I'm not saying I wouldn't support it, but I, I'm not comfortable proceeding right now with that type of motion. And I guess I go back to my earlier comment or question about projects. I would like to see Council have a workshop or a study session where we uh, throw ideas on the table, such as that one, such as Councillor Bonner's suggestions, and discuss them uh, and come to some consensus of priority and then uh, make motions based on that directing staff. So that would be my preference. So for that reason, I don't think I can support something today. Councilor Brown and Councilor. Yeah, I support this. Um, and I support it absolutely because the business case will come back to us and then we can make a decision then and that gives staff the, uh, uh, the direction to go along, uh, you know, to take a look. Do we need this or come back and say, hey guys, I think you're off base a bit. Um, but just with respect to decision making today, this is, I think, the second or third time this has happened where I think there's completely different impressions coming into these sessions about what is to be done. Uh, the one that stands out the most is committee. Um, I was under under the impression that this is what we were expected to do today. Maybe we don't get a way through it, but uh, just like at the committee and there was another one. So I'm not sure where uh, folks are getting different impressions, but I think we, we do need to rectify that because it's it's not uh, not a good thing when um, some of us are, are going through these agendas and spending a lot of time and then coming to a session where others maybe not have done that and then we're, we're in this this conversation again where some feel comfortable with these conversations and others don't. So I think we process wise that I, I know I'm not speaking to the motion on the table, but I think we need to sort that out because it's an inefficient uh, an inefficiency in time, uh, not just at this table, but also like how I spend my weekend. So Councillor Armstrong? Um, I too think we're supposed to be giving direction today, so I got uh, to come prepared to listen and then and vote on different uh, strategies because what it said they were seeking direction from council on their priorities. Um, I've heard from many people that environment is, and it's important for me too, uh, I would like to see in the report, because we're just asking for a report right now, we're not voting on a position, we're just asking for a report, what we're doing presently and can it be improved because maybe we don't need that position that we're already embedding it in there. So I will be supportive of, of the report going forward because it's not asking for position right now, it's just asking for a report. Mr. Rodolfo, Your Worship, I think everybody's right with this conversation. Again, this is the first round of this with this council. So part of Councilor Brown's conversation is getting ourselves organized around that. So I don't think you should be too hard on yourselves for the that is. It has been our practice to come here and ask for direction, broadly speaking, with respect to things. So we invest time to come back and give you an intelligent response on these business cases. At the same time, you may, you may be able to do some of that today and you may feel because there might be a divergence of opinion, you need a little more time to get that on the table. So we do have the luxury of a bit of time here and we'll be moving into July to help you work your way through that conversation about process and things. But what we tried to do today is explain to you the capacity of our budget currently, given all, you know, and maintaining this as a key, a key, a key piece of maintaining current service levels. Maintaining current service levels is still the way we do them currently another part of that. So I think there's a bit of an ask uh, of a shifting, shifting maybe the way we do things within our current envelope. So if, if we can get broad guidance and direction from Council today, that would be actually helpful for us. We can certainly schedule additional time for you to unpack topics and so forth uh, in July. And we'll have those afternoon GPC special ones, and that's possible. Um, I just want to also comment about, uh, we talk a lot about environment and active transportation, and there was a com question earlier about uh, finances and the whole business of, you know, there's, there's a grand assumption that we make a, a lot of revenue off of developments. What is the correlation between development and, uh, and uh, revenues? So our tax base currently projected for next year, this year is uh, around 68% of our revenues comes from residential and about 28% comes from business. So uh, the reality is that the residential portfolio does not necessarily pay the freight to cover the cost of services and all these low density subdivisions that are out there is a very expensive thing to provide a broad range of services to. So I think 
places like the OCP review are we talking about infusing a, 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 a look at that, that through an environmental lens, I think it would be wise through that process to have a very strong fiscal lens so we can start to address strategically some of those questions around financing. What is a smart way to, because uh, I think you'll see some interesting correlations between good planning and good fiscal management. Uh, and, uh, so I just wanted to put that on the table. Uh, and I think we do ourselves a service to address some of those questions because I think it probably frequently comes up. I'm paying big taxes and certainly won't line up some people that are paying big taxes. But we, we want to make sure that we're intelligently answering that and saying, hey, well, yeah, but for every hundred dollars worth of revenue that are generated through taxation for that type of residential development, it actually seems to be costing us about $130 to deliver the service. It'd be beneficial for us to be able to articulate that. And it would vary from different parts of the city depending on where it is. So the more dispersed, the more cost inefficient it is. And so in a roundabout way, I think you're going to see that have to be addressed through the OCP review as well as the specifics of the types of cases. So I just mentioned that because it came up. Councillors Kesselbrock, Armstrong, Thorpe, and Cummings in that order. Um, just a follow-up on that, because I do want to make sure, too, that when we're doing this, that there's the staff capacity, and I'm sure you'll let us know if we're overburdening them or some of that. And I would like to put that on the table as the OCG is a priority, because aren't we mandated by law to update it, and they're yep. overdue. So we're... Uh, it's in the budget. Yeah, and it's in the budget, so I think we have to do that, and that's going to take a lot of staff capacity, correct? So we need to be really careful when we're looking at some of these projects, and that's where I expect direction from our CAO that, you know what, we can't do this if we're going to do the OCP. So I think we need to make a decision on the OCP. I think that's a really important document, as we've all heard, because that's going to stretch our staff limitations to what projects we can and cannot do. So I think that's a discussion that we should have. I'm not making a motion now. I would just like to have discussions around that, as, as if we see that as a priority, then we should make the motion. Maybe we should have more discussion before we make any further motions. But I think it's an important one for me that um, if we're going to do it, it needs to get done, especially if it's in the budget. Or let's just tell staff we're not doing it and move the money. I, I think the comments of Councillor Armstrong point to something around Councillor Gesselbrock's motion, and that is that there is a desire for more discussion of great respect than there is to specifically focus on this motion. Um, and, and, and if I'm, I'm going to interrupt the order here and, and say this, uh, I, I don't think Councillor uh, Brown was in any way indicating that Councillor Thorpe's views on this were inappropriate. Um, I think what Councillor Brown has done is, is come with a fairly specific list. Uh, but um, I, frankly, and as much as I appreciate uh, that it would be lovely to give very good direction to staff this morning, um, I'm, I'll throw out on the table, if we're serious about doing a lot of things and we have a long wish list, maybe we should be saying to staff, we want a 1% cut across the board, you go find it, and we're going to take that 1%, and that's, that's money that we would use for projects that are near and dear to our heart. And that's the kind of direction that staff's looking for. I mean, I, I think we have to appreciate that it's, it's rather like, you know, the, 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 the cabinet saying, go beat the French at Waterloo. Uh, but you leave it up to Wellington to do it. Well, these are the Wellingtons around here, and they have to do it, and we're giving them fairly general direction, and so I think we need to be conscious of that. It is for that reason that I'm going to suggest, if it's uh, permissible, that we perhaps defer the discussion on Councillor Gesselbrock's motion for at least a few more minutes this morning until I get the sense that people have talked themselves out, uh, and I mean that in a kindly way, about their general views on this, because this is the, this is a kick at the can, uh, the substantial kick at the can, the process being outlined, so that we can perhaps arrive at some motions that uh, more generally affect something maybe not quite as specific this morning, but. Maybe, or maybe it's longer, maybe it's more complex, but I'm, with great respect, I think we've achieved a lot in 50 minutes, and we do have a little more time this morning, so. What's Council's sense of what I've just had to say? I'm prepared to vote on things. I'm prepared to vote on directions. You know, and I, I think it is pretty high level stuff, so. Councillor Kessel. Um, yeah, just speaking to my motion, I, I think that definitely some more discussion is uh, is needed, and I'm happy to defer, uh, you know, voting on this if it's necessary for 10 minutes, 15 minutes for, for more. Um, I think what I'm trying to get at is that we, 
there's a lot of things that we want to get done that are coming out of the pipes that I think are going to require a lot of integration and coordination because it's like plans, fitting in plans, and trying to put our strategic plan priorities into the OCP, and, and it's going to take a lot of folks um, and energy, and, and I think with this motion that's on the table, it's just a way to get an added person um, that can provide some needed integration, and it doesn't have to be pigeonholed focused on one thing, but it's like there's financial implications, there's development implications, and there's implications on our CO2 emission, depending on how well, our OCP and sustainability action plan and transportation master plan and parks plan all fit together so that we've got a coherent movement forward and all these pieces are working with each other. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at. And it is a larger discussion. I think you know, the idea that uh, uh, Mayor Croak put forward about um, you know, a 1% you know, cut to figure out if we can reorganize things in a way to just get that at a level of integration. I think that that's what to focus on. So, thank you. I, I just don't want to be in a position where I'm having to fit, say candidly, I want to really go out of order on this particular motion. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, so, I mean, I'm happy to continue the discussion. You can leave this motion on the floor and the mayor won't interfere with the discussion, but I just think there's a little more time for more discussion this morning. Uh, to get some general sense of what council's thinking, and then we can perhaps see, finish with being more specific this morning, or alternatively, defer to another meeting. Uh, because look, uh, this is, uh, as Mr. Rudolph has pointed out, it is June, and based on Ms. Fuller's schedule, which we saw this morning, I mean, I don't want to be throwing a whole bunch of staff uh, stuff rather at staff uh, much later in the summer or in the early fall when we should have been discussing it now. But at the same time. I think we need to recognize that um, this is the this is the time where we should be having these discussions. So, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and I guess we're still speaking to the motion. Uh, uh, I just wanted to respond to Councillor Brown's comment because I actually agree with him, uh, and and I appreciate the fact that some councillors have come to the table with definite ideas they want to put forward, and good for them. Uh, I guess where I'm coming from goes to my earlier question to staff regarding projects. What projects do we have uh, on the horizon? Because quite frankly, my priorities, I feel, are more related to bricks and mortar projects. And I could put a motion on the table right now about building a new uh, recreational center uh, in Chase River. But I'm not going to do that. But I'm interested in that. And I want to know where that project fits as a priority around this table compared to other things, such as the waterfront walkway and, and numerous other uh, specifics I could mention. So that's where I was coming from, and that's where I feel uh, a general discussion or workshop on what projects do we have on the, on the books, how do those fit into our priorities, and, and move from there. So that was my viewpoint. Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, I'm in support of the motion on the floor, um, but I do recognize that we've all come with different ideas of what we were trying to do today, and I want to acknowledge, as Councillor Brown already has, that we found ourselves in this position before, and it's created tension that I don't think we need, and I don't think is supportive of our process of decision making. So I would just like to um, establish that going forward, I think we should be clear <laughs> about what we're doing and not wait for staff to direct us about what they need us to do. Personally, I agree with Councillor Thorpe. Um, I don't yet feel like I have an understanding of these are the projects that are set in stone, where there's no movement here and they take up this percentage of our budget. These are the projects that we're contemplating or that have some wiggle room, um, and these are our dream projects. I think we've had one brief conversation about what those kind of dream innovative projects are, but we haven't for me, I don't feel like we've had a fulsome enough conversation and a process of prioritizing those for us to be able today to kind of set out motions to say, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do, especially given that there's some lack of clarity about what we're trying to do today. So personally, I would really welcome further conversation. I do support the motion on the floor because I don't think the environment, I think that's a very clear priority of ours and I'd be happy to get going on getting more information on how we can address that. Um, but as far as further motions, I would prefer to have that broader conversation of this is 
you know, this is what we're doing, this is where we have wiggle room, and this is where we want to go. And I think in, in the absence of that, we're kind of just shooting all over the place, and it's not really helpful to anyone. Councilor Shirley. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Councilor Robbins. No, I haven't spoken yet. I'll go out. So the question I have is, is the actual wording of Councilor Gesselbrecht's uh, motion. Can we have that repeated, please? Um, I have pages of notes here. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the motion is basically to have staff explore a business case on an environmental um, on a position that would, um, where is it? Mm -hmm. Um, to look at funding an environment position to increase the coordination um, between the different departments, work on the, um, the strategic um, direction regarding the, uh, that was another one. I know what the, I should I've got to write down what I would okay, perfect. I, I know what the, I should be recording. It was basically to work on the um, community um, environment um, sustainability. Maybe we'll let Councillor Gusselbrook yeah. read his motion if he has it written down. Uh, I'd like to move uh, that staff explore uh, additional staff capacity for coordination um, around environmental initi uh, sustainability initiatives using the funding connected uh, to the emissions reduction fund. Using the funding that is going to do. So, so requesting for a report. Yeah. The feasibility of Business case. Business case, yeah. Okay. Explore. Do I, do I sense it's time to call a question on this motion and then we can move back to a more general discussion? Is that a fair comment? Yes. yes. Well, there it is. All those in favor? Contrary? Motion carries. Thank you. We're back for a more general discussion. Everyone? And um, in fair? No. Nope. Fairness, I think Councillor Armstrong will go back. No, I don't need to, I was just going to ask you to call a question because I okay. think uh, it's We're done. We're done. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, so for my own learning and understanding moving forward, I would like to share, obviously active transportation is a really big priority for me and I think for a lot of folks on this council. We have a position that I believe is in the process of being hired around active transportation. I'd like to know before I put forward ideas, um, around strategic initiatives. Um, what is that person's role going to be in supporting our work in active transportation? So, for example, will they be in charge of wayfinding signage or, or identifying opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just, I don't feel quite prepared. There's a few missing pieces for me. Mr. Sims. Your Worship, I think, uh, to Councillor Hammond's point, I think a lot of that is the answer is yes. It, it's, uh, we're, we're hoping to attract a person that can see some of the coordination that's required between our active transportation networks, uh, including wayfinding signage and, and things like that, as well as marketing and education uh, public. So it is a pretty broad position, but it's, it's focused on active transportation. I will let Council know where it's a struggle to find someone so we've been, it's been out there and, and advertised, but we're, we're not getting the uptake on the Councillor Thorpe, I believe you know, I did not. Okay. Councillor Armstrong. Um, just, again, building on that, I'd like to know um, where we are in our sidewalk plans, like uh, a later date, because I know we've got a lot of sidewalks that need to be built. I know you guys have your priority list, I also know that um, it was changed by our, our past council for a certain spot. So I would like to know where we're at and um, what budget we've allocated for it this year. Because I think building sidewalks, especially those that don't to the schools, is really important to me for the children. So that would be um, one of the things I would like to know is the, is the list of, uh, and I apologize, I, I tried to find it, I couldn't find it. Um, where we are with that, because and what our budget is for that, because when I left, I think we only spent four hundred thousand last year, was it? So your worship, it dedicated to we we have a line item called pedestrian yeah. unallocated, and that's really for council's discretion. If there's a, a project that becomes glaring, uh, that council becomes aware of, that we can direct um, funding towards that, or if it's about the project. Usually, sidewalks are incorporated, or they're just rolled into other projects, or we're doing a, a corridor of 7th Street, for example, where we're going to try and incorporate sidewalks or at least walking shoulders. All, 
always looking for improvements on a, on a gross level. But to, to sort of have a specific uh, funding for sidewalks is, is fairly limited. Thank you. Councilor Brown. Councilor Bonner. Yeah, and, um, just a couple things. Um, I'm very supportive of Don's idea about the cross connections and things like that, but I believe that will be covered in our active transportation plan, and it's the 2020. Um, and then I too share Councillor Armstrong's uh, uh, concern about how do we fund things, especially through growth. And just a reminder that we have that motion going to UBCM um, around the expanded DCCs. Uh, or to have the province look at opening that up to expand DCC for things like fire halls, rec facilities. And, you know, I think the likelihood is pretty small they'll entertain it, but uh, you know, we are doing that advocacy work. Uh, I do like Councilor Clark, but um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the plans and uh, for facilities, especially we know some areas are underserved and we need to upkeep. Uh, we have our facilities master planning process that's about to begin, which I think would identify some of those items. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to just put those up there as reminders, and uh, I guess a question through to staff um, is through these business cases, coming back to the bylaw enforcement, is is that where we would identify that? Because uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a business case, but it's a. Uh, I think there is some concerns, or at least questions are, are we getting what we should be through bylaws? Through the chair, Councillor Brown, I've asked the manager of bylaw services to put together a statistical uh, set of uh, information with respect to the number of files, the types of files, the amount of time that's spent on different types of files, and then we need to also correlate that with the, the financial return on that in terms of the cost. and you know. Largely, I think the revenue side of the bylaw enforcement is attached to parking. So then there's a big philosophical conversation that needs to happen around that. And, um, you know, we're scheduled to bring a, a workshop on the downtown, for example, and I think that could be a big part of your day is understanding that. So make sure that that information is furnished as part of that. So, uh, and, and so there's a bit of a not to get into it today. There's a bit of a balance there that goes with. The, Revenues mean something is generating revenues, and what is that? That's fines and penalties, largely. And uh, what's the main source of that? Typically, parking. Where's the main source of the parking revenues? Typically, in and around the downtown. And you can start to see. So, is that something that you, that's? So we need to spend a little time explaining that, and maybe it is off. Maybe it's time to make an adjustment on that. Certainly, I, I would anticipate on the bylaw side that a large part of our bylaw team's time is spent with, uh, dealing with street uh, issues and homeless populations and so forth, which is not a revenue generating activity. Uh, probably a disproportionate amount of time is spent on that. So they, we can hopefully explain that and give you the storyline so that you can understand that where to go with that issue. So maybe the workshop on, on the downtown will be an enabler of that and make sure they'll try to couple that with that type of information. Please give me some facts. If I may, through you again to staff, is other than the Port Theater and the update to the Community Sustainability Action Plan, is the project lists and the plans on the horizon essentially the same that were included in last year's budgeting process? Because I think they were all outlined in those documents. And if so, can we get that list again? Yeah, so I haven't seen what's been submitted, but I would assume so. Yeah. We, are still, we are still receiving project submissions, so it, the, the, all the information is not into us yet for us to compile it. Directors still need to do their final review of what their staff have uh, recommended for the project plan. Your Worship, on the subject of capital, there's, there's a lot of infrastructure work and renewal and replacement and that type of thing, and then there's the new stuff. And then in addition to that, I think you're interested in our facility status. We are doing a facility review. I actually haven't seen the status of that pro project at all, so I can't comment on that, though. I do know, no, we, even on the basics, uh, we, we do have some space issues with our public work chart, our police station. Uh, the status of some of the buildings out there, we're all familiar with the curling rink and the uh, facility at Parcher Bay, it's an aging facility, so we need to come back to council and, and when we have it collated to the point where we can share that and maybe if it's not finished, maybe we need to bring you what we do have. So it's, 
as a, as a, just so we understand what we're talking about, it's infrastructure and it might be, well, it would be buildings and there could be other assets in terms of the parks uh, portfolio and so forth. So it sounds like you need that kind of information to make an informed uh, set of decisions on this topic. That's your honor. Thank you. Um, so I'm just trying to get my head around what is a case study and what we can ask for. Um, like I would like to see um, 20 additional bus shelters being built above what we're doing now each year. I'd also like to see 2,000 trees planted each year as part of a, a plan. Um, and, and there's a couple of things that you, uh, FCM um, at the, the conference there, um, I took a workshop on uh, sponsorships. And, and they're trying to suggest that, uh, well, sponsorships through mentalities is, is a large growing industry. And uh, we, we could potentially be in the neighborhood of one to two million dollars in extra revenue that we don't have to go back to taxpayers for, which we can spend on our bike lanes and all this other sort of stuff. Uh, in addition to that, I, 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 do have a, I do have some serious um, desires to change the way bylaws is being done in the city. Um, I've had a talk with, uh, with uh, Mr. Rudolph and, and, and the department head over bylaws uh, about some of the things that I, uh, I think we should be looking at, um, which I would hope would come back in, in the case study. Um, so I'm just kind of throwing that up right now. These are some things I'd like to talk about to see if these are case studies that we could be working on. Um, so I, I look forward to the conversation because I don't really have any of these fleshed up anyway, but I, these are just ideas that I might have that I'd like to see. Councilor Tom. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> With regard to the tree planting, uh, you remember that Rotary planted 180 last year. So, so, so that's the sort of thing that needs to go. It would be expanded. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's necessary to have the city do it all the time. It can be volunteer groups because you know, it costs the same about $10 a, a tree. So it's not, not yeah. Specifically, I was looking more along roadways. Like, it could be anywhere. Yeah. So. Um, anyway, aside from that, um, the thing that we, we've been struggling with, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the issue of affordable housing and, and, and homeless issues, and I know for the most part it's not the city's responsibility, however there are some things that we can or should be doing, and I, I, I kind of would like to see some of that brought forward. Doing full well that a lot of that has to happen in camera, but uh, that's things that I think we, we need to get become a little more serious If I may, while uh, others of you think about what you want to say or consider your wish list or whatever the case may be, um, one of the purposes of discussion like this this morning is, is obviously at some point we arrive at, at motions that uh, are quite directive to staff and, and they know what we want and, and will respond accordingly. Um, but we would be naive uh, if we didn't understand that uh, staff and the public, hopefully some of them anyway, uh, listen very carefully to the nature of the discussion around this table and what any individual councillor has to say from time to time uh, is going to figure in the response of staff, what they may be looking at on their desk or their wish list or their sense of priorities for their own department or where they fit in the scheme of things. Um, and, and they will respond, and they will come up with ideas, just as Mr. Rudolph listens carefully to what we have to say as well, uh, because he is the person we hire to hire everybody else, so to speak. So I think it's important that we have these discussions, uh, but we need to keep in mind that you are generating uh, thought processes and other people in staff every time an issue is raised at this table, whether or not it uh, resolves itself into a motion at some point or not, and if I'm wrong, I'd be happy to hear from staff, but I suspect that I'm somewhat right on this. So I just think we need to keep that in mind as we discuss these things. I mean, I, I threw out the concept of a 1% a cut across the board, not because I'm advocating for it, but simply because uh, being conscious of how budgets are put together in government and how you are so constrained by the existence of programs that you are expected to or have the responsibility to deliver, it leaves you very little wiggle room 
to undertake new programs that, that may reflect the priorities of a newly elected council or the public's wish at any given point in the year, etc. Uh, but um, I, I think we need to think about those bigger things. I mean, I think there's pretty clearly an emphasis around the environment, but what does that translate into? Does it mean, Councillor Bonner, we plant 180, 1,820 trees and leave them 180 to the Rotary, or do we uh, do we uh, enter into a partnership with the Rotary Clubs and say we're going to plant 2,000 trees a year and the city's going to pay for half of them, or what sort of things could, could we consider doing, or how do we uh, fund the Chase River Community Centre that I agree with Councillor uh, uh, Thorpe would be a, a very uh, appropriate uh, undertaking for council. There's no question the south end of this community has been underserviced and we're all conscious of the fact Sandstone is having its open house tonight to talk about a major development in the south end of our community. One only has to drive down in, the, in that part of the city to see the incredible housing development that is taking place there and the pressures uh, and the need for recreational facilities. So I'm just babbling on a little bit here in the hopes that maybe some of you will have somewhat more to say but I mean this is the time for the big picture but also we have to condescend in the particulars, as they say in legal pleadings, at, at some point too, and that will resolve itself into particular motions. But um, staff are listening, so uh, now is the time to give them something to listen to. Please. I'm confused. Are we going high level or are we going low level? Yeah. <laughs> going high and low. <laughs> I think if we decide, if the highs are, is basically the strategic plan to some extent, so the lows, if you will, are, are where we translate that into something that staff uh, and the city who uh, and the city can actually deliver. Councillor Armstrong. Um, I would like to have a discussion around number one, Port Drive. I think that's something that's been on this books for a long time. Staff did a lot of work on that. There's also the South End uh, Master Plan. I think we should be looking at that, if we're going to do that, or uh, my humble opinion, I think that should be uh, set out to a developer to do with uh, what we feel should be done. And I think it's also one that's um, very dear to Sinable, so I think that's one we need to be looking at with our renewed partnerships, is what are we going to do down there? Is it a priority or if it's not, then we need to let people know that. Because I think it's been, well, I've been here since back since 2010, and it's been on the table since 2010, so we're we got to start making some movement on some of these or just parking and tell people we're parking it for whatever reason and for how long. So, because that is one that's come up that was in our strategic plan since, well, I think, what, 2012, 2014, is one of our number one priorities and it's still not done. So, I would like to have a discussion around that and if, if people at this table think it is a priority and if not, then I think we need to be pretty frank with people that it's not our priority right now and this is where we're going. So, that's one I think we need discussion around and I think it also ties in with our downtown revitalization, which is we've been trying to do since the 1960s. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong is articulating something that I, I, I need to um, reiterate for myself and for everyone at the table. I think we're trying to do two tandem processes. We're trying to figure out what our priorities are and what we're going to fund. And I don't feel like we've had the fulsome priorities conversation. Do, does this council have an appetite for Wellport Drive redevelopment? Or is downtown a focus? Or is economic development a focus? And I think we've, I think with all due respect, it's really difficult to give that direction in the absence of us saying, amongst nine of us, these are our top three things that we want to accomplish in our term. And then we, then we put money at it, or we put money to it. But, so I think right now we're trying to figure out what we want to put money to without having a clear understanding of what our priorities are. And it's just becoming really messy. We have a strategic plan, but those, that strategic plan is very high level. We haven't yet drilled down. Um, so for me, that we're, um, these processes are, are becoming very muddy. I don't really know what to do with that. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe and then Mr. Rudolph. As soon as you're looking for people to fill air time, you're working. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat more sophisticated than that. <laughs> I will try to be succinct nonetheless. I agree with Councillor Evans and also with Councillor Armstrong's comments. And uh, and again, I think we would benefit from from a brainstorming session with uh, charts on the wall and sticky little 
tabs from my school days where we could identify our priorities. Uh, I mean, I've got a list of them here that I could start to speak to, uh, but I don't really think that would benefit us too much. But uh, I think we need to get a sense of consensus on uh, do we want to go ahead with Port Drive? How much do we want to spend on the waterfront walkway at this point? And so on. Uh, and I think we'll find that there's a huge list of uh, either potential new projects or initiatives related to uh, transportation or active lifestyles or whatever, uh, not to mention some of the renewal projects that we need to undertake in terms of our city facilities. Uh, so I think it's going to be a long list, but I think, I think we need to, to throw those ideas against the wall and, and get a consensus of what's important, what do we want to spend our money on. Mr. Rudolph, and then Councillors Armstrong and Brown and Edward. George, I really don't know where to go with my comments at this stage. I think we're talking process, we're talking projects, we're talking, uh, again, it's a different style that we're implementing of a new council. So it's still, we're still in year one of the process. So this, this is a normal undertaking to come and ask for direction. And uh, so I, uh, you know, one thing I would say is that the motion that you have approved is definitely aligned with the strategic plan, which happens to also uh, inform the fact that the only major committee that you've established to date will be is the Environment Committee. So there's a very long, strong correlation there. It's also likely that that committee and the works uh, that will be behind the scenes and support that will generate much more clarity on the status of all of our projects and how, how that will inform future decision making for sure. So there's a process that will take place that will enable a lot of that to happen. Um, so, I mean, again, we're keeping the lights on, the waterworks, the pools are open, the streets, there's a whole system that takes up the line share what we do. And uh, so that's, this is, this is embedded in all of this. We're talking about dealing with maybe slightly modifying what we do now, plus also adding some additional things into the mix. And the way to define that is through our strategic plan and the other plans that are kind of come along in our budgets and so on. So I think we're, there's a, a balancing act of, and, and then we've gone through a period of uh, uh, austerity, I'd say, with the organization to the point where we're trying to re rebuild our basic capacity to uh, make sure we're de dealing with the fundamentals and then have the ability to be innovative and move forward. So we've been working through all that and we're aware of that. So, uh, you know, there's ample opportunity and we've set up the GPC for more brainstorming and clarity around this type of thing. And I do say that we do have some more time to work through that because it seems to be an appetite for council to do that to make sure that we're all on the same page. And, uh, and in the meantime, we have to continue down the road of developing budget process because it's huge <laughs> and uh, behind the scenes. So we just want to make sure that we're generally aligned and I do agree with the mayor. Any comments that it, that is mentioned by council at this table are all taken into into the administration's uh, knowledge bank of what your individual and hopefully collective priorities are. So don't uh, don't feel that anything that you do say is take a note of because it does influence I think our staff most helpful if we get it in the form of a motion, but it's also informative in where you're all coming from, so it's good. I don't know what that said, but that's <laughs> kind of my read of where we're at. <laughs> Councillors Armstrong, Brown, Thorpe, and I guess I'll probably I want to go back to the meeting exactly like um, Council Thorpe said, where we threw everything on the board, and that's how we got with our plan real fast. I would like us to have another meeting, whether it be especially in camera or GPC, where we do that. Like, and I think each of us take our top five projects or, or priorities, throw them on there, and we're going to find some consistencies, which will help us. Because otherwise, we could do this for all year. Like, I think we need to, if we did that, that would really streamline things. Like, if it's, like, active transportation, and there's six people say active transportation, well, then obviously that's a priority for this council. Or if they say the OCP, there's a priority. I think that would, I found that exercise you did, Mr. Rudolph, very, very helpful. I thought it really moved our process along really fast. And I think that might be, I don't know how the rest of council feels, but I think it might be very helpful for this process. Councilor Brown? Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, I think we've done that process, and we adopted it two, three weeks ago. Uh, so when we talk about our OCP, 
that is a listed concrete item in our OCP. Completed. Uh, develop city property at one point drive. Completed. Uh, or, or solidified. Uh, continue the walkway, uh, uh, construct an interim walkway around one point drive. Like we have concrete things that are what I hope staff have already gone, taken away and are actioning and uh, figuring out around uh, how they get completed. Staff created these timelines. So if there was an issue, um, you know, obviously things do happen and some of these items will be delayed or, and some will be done earlier. But staff went away and developed these timelines. So if I, I'm getting a little, I think, frustrated and I apologize for that because we've adopted a strategic plan that went through this process. We received a five-year forecast that had the plans, that had the, the budgets, and um, all that information has been given to us and given to us multiple times. So, you know, if, I think if we, like, if we need to adjourn the meeting and just go away and read our own strategic plan and, uh, and the, our previous documents that we have, we might be better served than continuing, continuously to be having conversations about recreating a process that we've just gone through. I think Alison Brown's just uh, re-emphasized in the post from the 60s that I always quote, you know, the end of all our journeying shall be to return to the place in which we began to you know it for the first time. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, this time I'm not sure I do agree with Councillor Brown, but I understand his frustration. Uh, but I, I think we're at a place where we're, we're, we're delving deeper into the strategic plan and being much more specific, and we need some more specific costings. We're talking budget here. And to Mr. Rudolph's points, which I appreciated, yes, we're keeping the lights on and our basic service levels are being maintained, and that's great. But personally, at a high level, I want to see this council do more than that. I want to see some new initiatives, and yes, some of those are already identified, but what exactly do we want to see done in the next year, and how much is it going to cost? And what is that money going to take away from, from putting into another project? And so I still think there's room for that discussion. But I guess my main point, uh, Mr. Mayor, is, is Your Worship, is that I want to do more than just maintain service levels, let alone reduce things by 1%. I want to see us take some initiative and move certain things forward this term. And, and, and I think I'd like to see us definitely come to consensus on what those concrete items are, more specific than are just listed in the strategic and get an idea of costing and approve that. And somebody either agrees or disagrees. <laughs> He's having trouble on the coffee machine. And I'll go and help him. Councillor Gesselbrock and Councillor Hemmings. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you. It, it seems pretty clear to me that the, the point of this process is that uh, I think a workshop on, on projects is, is needed where we can look at what's uh, potentially on the books and, and maybe come some idea of where it's a bit more costed out and then have a discussion on what we want to accomplish this year. Um, and I think just the, the discussion on process and maybe some of the confusion I think just uh, reinforces the need um, for an agendas committee where discussions on process, wh what comes when and, and when we bring things forward is discussed so that the council is all on the same page. and we're linked, synced up with where the, the organization is, and I think that is going to help facilitate, you know, a smooth process where, where folks aren't confused. So I would like a movement on the attendance committee, and if it requires a motion, maybe not at this meeting, but I'll be happy to. And I do think that I do often hear that staff is looking for direction, um, and I think that it is difficult when each, uh, in terms of process, each councillor is putting out ideas. Um, when we do need to have a general consensus uh, for staff to really take action on it. So using the, the process of putting a motion forward so we can have a discussion at the committee level to then set staff you know, focused on something is useful and a habit I think that we can get more into as we get more comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, I just want to respond to Councillor Brown's frustration and, and say that I, I really hear that and um, I think if it were simply a matter of we've had that conversation and the strategic plan has been set, then staff wouldn't be coming to us looking for extra um, additional uh, support or insight or you know direction. 
So I think what this has shown me is that we have a bunch of priorities that we've identified in our strategic plan. We cannot do them all. It's a strategy to say that's where we want to go, and now it's our turn to say specifically this is what we want to do. And I think truly that you have an advantage in, in having been in this realm and have some innovative ideas, and I think it would be really useful for all of us to hear those and have a discussion um, rather than just saying we've had the strategy discussion and let's rumble, because I don't think we're all in the same place. And so this is just me again reiterating, I think we need one more conversation around this. Councilor, like I understand what Councilor Brown is saying. That yes, we did do that, but we can't do all our strategic plan. Even with the timelines in there, timelines are just a guideline. We can't do it. We can't do number one drive, or drive. We can't do downtown. We can't do the OCP. We can't do all our projects in one year. We don't have the money unless we want to increase taxes 10 to 20 percent, which I'm not prepared to do. We only have a certain amount of tax dollars to play with, and that's what we have to decide unless we want to raise taxes a lot to support all these things. I would love to put 10 more firemen, 20 more policemen on the streets, but that's what, 30% tax increase. We can't do that. So we have to streamline what we picked in our strategic plan, What we, and each one of those has got five priorities. We couldn't even do one of our, our pillars with, with our budget. So we need to make some decisions on what is the important things for our staff and also staff capacity. If we chose the OCP, that's going to take how many staff members away from their normal disease that they can't be working on projects. Or they, I mean, number one, Port Drive, that was two years into making that plan with how many staff members involved in a city. No action. I mean, that's demoralizing for staff. We've heard about all the great plans that are out there, and we never act on them. So we, as a council, need to make a decision which plans do we want to act on. And we can't choose them all. As much as we'd like to, it might mean active transportation wait until next year. It might mean um, the trees wait till next year or Chase River waits till next year because I too would love to see a recreation facility in Chase River because they have nothing and they've got a large population. So we need to really be prepared to make what, what and I don't think we can do more than three, three of our priorities realistically with our staff and with the dollars without a huge tax increase. We're already at what, 3.7%, 3.8? 3.6, without even any of our projects. That's just maintenance. So to add all this new stuff, unless there's people that have got some really creative ways of finding dollars, let's start looking at 7-8% tax increase. I don't think our citizens want that. They're not ready for it and they don't want it. So we need to be really strategic on which we are going to do now. And what does the majority of the city want? That's my two cents and I'll shut up. Mr. Rudolph, we're giving us good information as to how to come back and, and facilitate a, or enable a conversation that gets to clarity of, of what's in budget, what isn't in the strategic plan, and those types of things. Uh, there's, there's a lot of balls in the air with the city. You know, the one Port Drive is an area where we need to have another conversation. And, uh, staff have been busily going along and cleaning up the background, the leases, and all the things that go with the site. And so it's, uh, there's a road being built, the walkway. Oh, there's a lot of action down there, so you will come to a place where you're in a position to uh, make some decisions around the process and timing around that, that property and those, those properties. There are a lot of stakeholders attached to that, so it's not a simple it's an exercise with First Nation, the Florida Authority, uh, various landowners, it's in the downtown and business community and others. So there's, there's a lot of process around that, but um, we want to help you to help get to a place where you're comfortable with things. It doesn't sound like you're necessarily entirely comfortable, which I predicted. Uh, part of the conversation. I only predicted this. In fact, I thought it would be even more confusing than it is. Uh, but that's okay. We're still uh, working our way through the chemistry of working collaboratively through this process. So. Uh, we, we, we can certainly, I think we need at least one additional GPC in July to work our way through some of this stuff. And uh, we can come back and give you, a, well, we hope it's enough information in advance of that meeting that you're prepared to have. And I think I'm hearing, for the most part, what's in the strategic plan is in, is in our budget system. So if it isn't, we'll clarify that. If it's some additional, more specific things or what we're trying to get accomplished this year or whatever, I think we can get to that level of granularity, hopefully with uh, maybe one workshop in, in three weeks or something like that. This is time to prepare for that. And, uh, 
So that in, in addition, this has been helpful for us, by the way. So don't, don't beat yourselves up too badly. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's all good. Speaking of beating, I'll let Councillor Brown have the last kick, and then we'll take attendance. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, I absolutely agree with Councillor Armstrong, and that's like. We gave the strategic plan to staff, and they've come back and said one port, develop city property at one port drive, 2022, right? Three years from now. We, we're not saying, you know, we adopted this because we didn't say go out and do it in 2019. We, we, we got a time frame back, which I trust is a reasonable time frame to complete the work. Um, you know, I, looking at the five year forecast, you know, there is money put aside for these different projects, and like Mr. Rowe said, I have to trust that if there wasn't to be identified in our strategic plan, it would come back through this very process and say, if you want to do this. Um, I think my frustration a little bit lies, and I apologize for being frustrated, but is that, one, we're told to keep the so, council guess what I put forward a motion and said, well, maybe that's a little too specific. We need to keep it high level. We'll, we've already gone through that process, and now it's right back to, hey, let's get specific again. So what are we actually trying to do? Right? <laughs> Specific, you know, I can go back to where I started with some ideas that I thought were relatively cheap that would, go, that would fit within our strategic plan, but the money is not a, a huge issue. And I'm happy to go to that place again. It's just this process I find is very, very confusing. Thank you very much. We will reconvene at 1043 precisely. If you're not in your chairs, tough luck. <laughs>
some motions or make some motions that would be uh, the kind of direction that staff is looking for. It's wonderful to cast out the, uh, the, the concepts, but uh, it's very mo much more helpful for staff if they have specific motions. So unless I hear to the contrary, I'm going to assume that um, we can uh, move on to other agenda items now on the basis or understanding that we will have uh, one more meeting. I was just saying that Ms. Scurry is going to guide me in a second or two, and that will give a moment for some of us to get seated. And um, yes, thank you, Worship. So I, I believe you're right. Um, based on the discussion um, that has been had this morning, at least one more meeting on this subject will probably um, be necessary in the next few weeks, as Mr. Rudolph suggested. Um, we will have a, a process and um, some more clear guidance for council to get their direction at that meeting so stay tuned and yes we'll definitely have a another uh, meeting to help you um, give us some direction with respect to the budget and i'm very appreciative of the uh sorry 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 <laughs> 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 much nicer, much nicer I'm, I'm very appreciative of the, the, the schedule that was outlined uh, to us this morning by Ms. Uh, and I'm not wishing to delay this either and, and sooner rather than later. Uh, we are coming into the summertime and, and staff and everybody, particularly those with families, are probably looking for some time off uh, in order to get a little, uh, little rest and relaxation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that we're then in a position that we're not delaying this and leaving it hanging over people's heads and making their difficult lives any more difficult than they already are. So if that's the general consensus, uh, we'll look to you, Ms. Curry, to uh, get some timing scheduled and subject to what Mr. Rudolph feels is appropriate in terms of how fast staff can provide whatever further information they think may be appropriate arising out of this morning's meetings. I suspect it's not that much. Um, but uh, I, I think we just need a level of comfort and then staff need the level of comfort that comes from motion so that we can move forward, okay? If there's no further discussion, then we're going to move on with the agenda. And I want to thank Ms. Mercer and Ms. Fuller this morning for uh, all their work in this and, and the contributions of other staff and, and also council. I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important and I, and I'm going to state publicly what I think many of us feel from time to time, uh, is that given the constraints of, of time and position and everything else, it's not always easy for us to have the kinds of discussions that we'd probably all like to have. Uh, but uh, whenever we can, we should relish them and enjoy them for what they are, even if they lead to occasionally a level of frustration. Or alternatively, a pure joy in, in listening to the intelligence that uh, exists around this table, uh, both on council and, and the staff. So uh, we have no delegations, but we do have a number of reports and requests that we have to consider. We have the material in front of us. So the first, uh, Mr. Lindsay, please, the Unitarian Emergency Shelter Funding Request. Morning, Your Worship, Council. Uh, this first report this morning is to seek uh, Council's direction for allocating $20,000 from your Housing Legacy Reserve for extended hours at the Unitarian Emergency Shelter. And this funding will allow for extended hours to continue for the balance of this year up until the end of March 2020. Uh, as outlined in the report, the Unitarian Shelter has been offering for the past decade. Uh, in 2011, the City began funding 
non-cold weather nights at the shelter. So it is an extreme weather shelter that's funded by the province, but on those non-extreme weather nights, the city had been funding that, and that had been taking place since 2011. We spent on average about $45,000 a year. We had been up until last year on funding those non-cold weather nights. Uh, in July of 2018, the province, um, this, this came out of um, the attempts to the action and response, uh, agreed to open up uh, that shelter early and fund it in its entirety. So the city's not being requested for its normal funding that we've been providing the last number of years for non-weather nights because they've been funding from July and that's going to continue through until this March uh, of next year. Um, but we are seeking um, some support and funding for these additional hours. And we did last fall, uh, Council allocated $7,800 for this very program. Uh, which took us through until March of this year. That funding's now expired and we're asking for it to be extended uh, again from this fall, taking us through to March. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Before we get to the delegation questions for Mr. Lindsay, yeah. that's where I'm strong. Um, I, I personally believe that some of that shower program that's hand in hand with that, is that program still running that we funded? Yes, the, uh, the shower program, um, and count, if I recall, there's $40,000 a year. Council's budget to, uh, um, to operate the shower program in the Unitarian churches is the operator. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. I'd like to welcome Lois Peterson, the Executive Director of NAMI Unitarian Shelter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops. I'm not really nervous. I've just sat there for an hour and a half. I'm more nervous. Um, Your Worship, Mayor and Council, um, members of staff, the American writer Anne Lamott said there are only two prayers. One is help. The other is thank you. And really, I think that should be enough for me. But as I've prepared these notes and I've been editing for the last hour and a half, so if you'll give me five minutes, I will use them. Um, we're pleased to be here today to speak to our request for funding from the City of Nanaimo. And firstly, we wanted to recognize and thank the Social Planning Department for being such strong advocates of our service and for supporting our funding request. Providing warm, safe, overnight respite from the streets for those without homes in Nanaimo has been the central mandate of, our serv of the Nanaimo Unitarian Shelter for the past 11 years. When the city first came to the Unitarian Fellowship in 2008 with a request to consider providing emergency shelter services, the fellowship took on the challenge with pride and energy. What began as a small volunteer-run operation with mats on the floor of the Unitarian Fellowship Hall, I think we maybe operated with 12 mats to start with. It's since become a permanent seasonal 30-bed program, offering overnight shelter for homeless men and women of Nanaimo funded over time by three levels of government, federal, provincial, uh, municipal, and along with donations and corporate grants. But while providing a warm, safe place to sleep, nutritious food, clothing and sundries, access to laundry service, and referrals to additional supports is at the heart of what we do. The non-judgmental welc non welcome and companionship that guests receive from staff and volunteers is just as important to their well-being. In the fall of 2018, the city provided us with a grant to extend hours beyond those that which were funded through the contract with BC Housing. And with those funds, we were able to offer enhanced services and supports to our clients in the evening hours along with an extra hour so that our guests could eat breakfast and prepare for another day on the streets before we closed in the morning. During those extra evening hours, we've hosted a representative from TD Bank who presented on personal finance and budgeting. Election Canada spent time with our guests explore, explaining voting eligibility and practices. Other presentations on GED learning, pre-employment skills and literacy training provide guests with new ways to take the next steps to managing their own lives. And volunteers with skills and interests prov provided passive and active recreational and leisure activities along with companionship. And in fact, if, if, we get, if you're able to provide us with the funding uh, we've requested, just this morning, Kevin, our shel shel shelter coordinator who was here with me, who disappeared, I think, to go do some work, um, 
He's just whispered in my ear, we should get the fire department in to talk to our guys about how to prevent fires in the park. We can only do that kind of stuff with extra hours. It's a great idea, I thought. As the homelessness situation in Imo has changed and grown, so have the services offered by the Unitarian Shelter. In 2017, at the request of the city, we started to run the shower program at Caledonia Park. We've initiated annual community dinners to bring shelter guests together with Unitarian Fellowship members, donors, and funders. We partner with a local service club to run an annual clothing drive, which generates enough donations to meet the needs of our own guests, as well as providing coats and clothing that we pass on to other organizations. And we're currently developing a program to share information about homelessness and the work of the shelter with elementary schools in Nanaimo. An important part of our work is to engage with the local neighborhood residents, businesses, and schools to ensure that the impact of shelter activities and guest behavior is minimized. In April, we did a mail drop to a local community neighborhood to inform them that shelter service would be continuing through the spring and summer and to let them know how to contact us about any issues that concern them. I've only handled one problem this year, um, two or three last year which is testament to working with the neighbors and how important that is. The culture of the Unitarian Shelter is to anticipate change, to embrace it, and then to look for new ways to support the homeless of our community. With the summer before us, expanded hours of service will allow us to engage in even more meaningful interactions with shelter guests, provide new opportunities for social engagement, offer welcome shelter during the long hot days, and play a small role in, ad in addressing the city's goal of providing expanded daytime services and supports to the more vulnerable of our community. We're proud of the relationship we've developed with the city of Nanaimo over the last years, and we're very grateful for the support of council and staff. And we look, we look forward to your support as we continue our work during the summer. And I, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions and also invite council members who don't know much about us or haven't been to our shelter. Give us a shout. We'd lo love to give you a tour. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Peterson. I appreciate you being very timely because I hate to have to be the Grim Chief and there's a little mem few members. Please stay. A few members of the public here to watch this morning. I would ruthlessly enforce the five minutes as I try to be fairly across the board. Uh, Councillors Armstrong and then Thurk, please. I just wanted to really thank you for the work you did. Uh, I know that you generate very few calls to service for other fire department police. I think it's excellent, and uh, I sincerely hope you're going to be part of our health and homeless task force because you're doing amazing work. I thank you. Councillor Thurk. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, the delegation, uh, thank you, Ms. Peterson, uh, for the work that you and Mr. Griffith and the others do at the shelter. I, I cannot overstate my admiration for the work that is done at that shelter. And it's, as you've indicated, I think, so much more than just a shelter. And I really appreciate the education component that you've built into your model. And my question to you is, regarding your service delivery model, if I can call it that, you have 30 beds. Would you say that's an optimum number? Or would you prefer to be bigger? Would you prefer to be smaller, to deal with a smaller group of people? How, do, how, do you, how could you uh, respond to that? For the space that we have, it's the optimum. At one point, we were operating um, up to 24 beds, and we did a bit of reconfiguration. The minute you add new guests, the dynamics change, the demands on staff change. Given the facility that we have, we don't have any capacity for any additional space to add additional guests. When there was the fire at the Terminal City um, temporary housing there, we were asked whether we might be able to accommodate a few people on a temporary basis. We would have, we, we said yes, we always say yes to everything and then we figure out how to do it. Uh, we would have been able to do it, we would have had to use it in the, found, in the fellowship um, sanctuary. We just cannot put more than 30 people downstairs. No, and if I may, Your Worship, perhaps I wasn't clear on my question. It's not could you expand, it's is the number of beds that you currently have uh, the right number for being able to offer all of the services that you do? Yes, I think it is. We've, we've met, we've, over time, we've developed the way we work in, so that we benefit everybody in the best way that we can. Um, I think less, certainly the less people you're working with, the more one-on-one, -on -one, the more personalized service you can give, the better you get to know them. But because a lot of our guests are return guests, we get to know them well. 
we get to learn their needs over a period of time, we can transition them to other situations that might be helpful to them. So 30 is a good number for us, yes. One more if I may, Your Worship. Um, that being the case, could you see the services you offer with your model being replicated if there was another space and other staff to run it? Area of the well, the temporary shelter that was um, run <coughs> partly by, I think, the Women's Centre up on at that church um, was similar to our model. Um, the shortcomings of our model is that we're co-ed in a single space, and studies have shown that women are reluct many women are reluctant to share common space, and I understand why. We don't have, if we were to separate the genders, we would be able to accommodate less people. So we're always working with that balance. So the model that we have is good. We know how to work with it. We know how to how guests benefit from it. Ideally, if we were able to separate the genders, we would be able to attract or make more, make welcoming, welcome more female guests. And our numbers are very low for women guests right now. Yeah. Thank you again for what you do and, and, and also for the expectations that you put on your clients. I appreciate that. Helps. Thank you very much. Thank you for your prayer for help and I'm asking for the recommended motion so it can be followed with a prayer of thanks. So moved by Councillor Bonner, seconded by Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? All those in favor? Sorry? Just a little bit of discussion. Um, oh, sorry. I, I think this is a, a fabulous program um, and that the this, this example is, is a really good neighborhood and um, really good neighbors working together. And I would like to remind staff, um, uh, not staff, sorry, my council and the public that this is a shelter that exists directly across from a elementary school and kitty corner to two daycare centers. So this this can work and it, and it does work in our community. So I'd just like to throw it up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Bonner. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next community development grant to Mid Island Youth and Community Development Cooperative, Mr. Harding. Sorry, Councillor Gesselbrock. You need to uh, absent yourself. Conflict. By all means. Mr. Harding, you're on. Thank you, Your Worship. Just bring this uh, grant back for council consideration. Um, council did approve a grant of $6,250, uh, finance and audit, I should say, um, a month or so ago. Um, but they did ask that we go back and clarify some financials uh, with the group. And because the group hadn't had security of having the grant, we were late getting this to council. They reduced the, the, the program that they put on. And so we're just coming back asking you to rescind the finance and audit motion um, previously approved and approving a new motion of $2,850 for this organization. It's already from the event and did a great job. Thank you very much. Can I have the first motion? Councillor yeah. Armstrong, yeah. second yeah. Councillor Turley. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Then on to the second motion. Councillor Hemmons, seconded Councillor Brown. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very much. 911 funding, Chief Fry, good morning. Good morning, Your Worship. Uh, so, uh, as Council may be aware, uh, out of Fire Station Number One, we, we operate Central Island 911 Fire Dispatch, provides fire dispatch services uh, from communities from Lanceville up to the top of the Malahat and the entire Cowichan Valley. It's a partnership uh, shared between the City of Nanaimo, the Regional District of Nanaimo, and Cowichan Valley Regional District. As part, uh, as many of you may know, 911 funding and the 911 service has evolved a lot since its inception in, in the mid 80s. And uh, from, from before where it would just dial 911 and you'd pick up a phone and it, it'd be at a central organizing or a central agency. Now, uh, currently we can actually pinpoint where the caller is calling from and not just the radio towers. So we get address location information uh, that is geocoded. Uh, with new technology, this is mandated through the CRTC, and it's called Next Generation 911. It's the next portion of this. And if, as part of Next Generation 911, we're preparing the system for a new digital technology. 
and in the future we may see things such as uh, text to 911. We already have that for our, our hearing impaired uh, individuals, uh, but video feeds and everything else into the 911 system. So as part of that, we're mandated to upgrade through the CRTC, our existing firewall, in order to prepare it for uh, the next gen, as we call it. And as such, uh, we need uh, $30,000 uh, for the 911 system. Fortunately, we do have a 911 reserve, and that is uh, currently uh, sitting in excess of $30,000. And that really is uh, through the 911 um, call answer levy. Uh, we equally split this uh, reserve through our partners. So, and they have all agreed uh, to this funding request, but in order to release it from the reserves, we need your approval. Councillor Armstrong. Move the recommendation. Seconded, Councillor Hammonds. Chief Fry, nothing more pleasing than being told we already have the money and we just have to say yes. Any discussion, Councillor Bob? Thank you, Rick, for you to uh, Chief Fry. Um, the TELUS, when they announced their fiber optics they're putting in the city, also mentioned something they call a green case, which they hang on uh, light posts, which uh, provides Wi-Fi service for cell phones, as opposed to using cell towers. Um, with that new development, uh, is that going to change the way you're able you know, to pinpoint people or make it more accurate? Currently, uh, the way that we're pinpointing is uh, through through your your cellular telephone and how it's it's. Uh, uh, it's being geocoded, which is probably through satellite technology uh, currently. However, that works. It's magic. So the magic will continue. The magic will continue. So, so as part of this firewall, what can happen? And it's not really as applicable uh, for the fire service, but it's an opportunity to something that we call a rebid. And what that means is, I can dial 911, and it'll say within. 300 meters, I'm at this location. Uh, what a rebid does, it, it allows a 911 operator to go back in and pull it your current uh, your current data. This helps in many cases with police uh, police incidents. If people are, are kidnapped, for example, and they're calling from a trunk of a car, it allows you uh, to see where that's moving to. Passing. That's a lovely image to leave us with. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed, motion carried. Thank you very much. The Green Fleet Strategy, Mr. Sims. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Council. Just uh, you have a report in front of you that uh, staff are re recommending that the city joins the Fraser Basin Council's E3 or uh, Green Fleet program. It's a, a fairly nominal cost. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of past fleet managers and our current fleet manager, Mr. Evans, in getting us to this point. Quite honestly, uh, it, it's been a really solid approach to managing not only costs and fuel consumption, but greenhouse gases, of course. Uh, and this will actually help formalize that and put some uh, an opportunity to communicate how well we're doing or opportunities for improvement and uh, it gives some benchmarking tools. So uh, this, this is for Council's consideration. Mr. Evans is here in case you have specific program questions or anything else. Any questions? Questions? Move the recommendation. recommendation. Councillor Armstrong seconded. Councillor Gesselbrock. I have a question. Oh, but I, you will second okay. as well? Yeah, I'll second. Ask your question. Oh. Oh, I, I just with the recommendation that says purchasing two mountain bikes with trailers for the use of city horticultural staff. Um, is there any considerations of potentially enhancing those mountain bikes with oh, electrical uh, capacity? Just, I mean, trailers can be heavy, and it's quite a hilly, it's a hilly um, environment. And, and having an e-bike, it is so much more effective in terms of transportation. Having it electrified. So. Uh, just did for the, so that it'll actually be in trucks. Uh, <clears throat> through Mr. Chair, um, I can answer that. Uh, we're open to looking at all kinds of different al alternatives. We work with the departments to see what will work with their operational need. If, it, if there's uh, a need for it, I'll have those discussions with the manager and their staff. Chief Stick. 
Alistair Brown. Yeah, not a question, uh, just a comment. Um, I think this is awesome. You, you know, working with others to produce evidence to, to get where we need to go is wonderful. Um, I think, as Mr. Sims highlighted, you know, this has been an area that I think we've been excelling at, and I, you know, and I was super jazzed when Mr. Evans uh, presented on the environmental day that uh, you know I had complete confidence that this was going in an awesome direction. So, so thanks. Uh, fully supportive of this. Jazz. Jazz. <laughs> I sense a certain enthusiasm around the table this morning. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. thing. <laughs> Better than the image being stuck in the front of a car. <laughs> All Councillor Bob. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Kirby. Um, thank you, Worship. So the, the one question I have with regard to the uh, yearly cost breakdown is uh, what is the meaning and what is the uh, reason for E3 fleet rating? Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, I can answer that. Um, so the E3 fleet rating would be, uh, like we said, that there's uh, a rating service that they can do for municipalities, which you can get a bronze, gold, um, platinum level rating, and you can use that to wear as a badge of honor to say how good our city's doing and compare against other municipalities in the region and across Canada. So it's a real value. Involve any discounts or I'm not sure what's out there. There could be, but we can, you know, these are things that you look into. And as well, working with E3 Fleet, they're going to point us in those directions as well to, to say what we can accomplish. Thanks. Councilor Bonner. Your Worship, with you, staff. Um, I noticed that this is being funding in, internally, which I'm guessing you found money within your existing budget to pay for it. Um, do you have any more money in there? <laughs> <laughs> Not that many couches. <laughs> um, uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, we, we've managed to find some funding this year. Uh, I would like to be able to capture it in my actual budget ongoing so that we can actually make sure that we're putting that money aside to make sure we continue doing this project. So, yeah. Any further, Councillor Hammonds? Thank you. Um, so I see. What I'm reading this report as is that there's two distinct advantages to joining this. One is to help us measure what we're doing, and the other is to allow us to kind of communicate that through these rankings. Now, we've kind of identified that the, the greening we've been doing over of our fleet over the last 10 years has reduced our GHG emissions by 15%. Are with joining this initiative, are we going to gain better tools for evaluating or assessing? And my question comes from, it looks like we're already doing a pretty good job of evaluating, which is one of the pieces of why we would join this. So if I could just have some clarity on that. Sure. Um, through Mr. Chair, um, yeah. So I believe by joining E3, we have, well, in the past, we've done all kinds of terrific things, obviously. Um, but you can't really manage what you don't measure, the way I look at it. By putting this together, it's going to set realistic targets so we can actually have something to work, to work towards for a long-term plan. Oh, I'm just when you, you talk about lowering the uh, fuel consumption by 15 percent, is that just city vehicles or does that include the RCP vehicles? That's that not included. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Sims, you make BC Municipalities Funding Program for Flood Risk Assessment Mapping and Mitigation Plan. Thank you, Worship. This, uh, this report is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we were in front of you in February to ask about accelerating this particular project from 2022 to 2021 so we could take advantage of a grant opportunity. Uh, we were successful in receiving. That's the good news. So that uh, was a, an acceleration of about one year. Um, and we've received $150,000 in approval. Part of the grant funding uh, conditions is that we accelerate it further. So they want the work completed by this time next year. So that uh, we need to reset the financial plan to incorporate that. Right off the hop, I think we're going to handle $75,000. So we need to create a line item in this year's budget for that. That's the, the one piece of it. The other piece is that um, in the interim, the provinces added additional scope um, to 
sort of in the, in the study of the, uh, the inundation from Jump Creek Dam, we've got a parallel uh, stream in Fourth Lake Dam, which is owned by Harmac. So we estimate that the additional scope that the province has put on our uh, shoulders is about $100,000. So we're, we're kind of back to where we were fairly close. But we think we can finish it all up. Uh, we still have this $150,000 grant, but the, the project cost is increased. Any questions for Mr. Sims? Councillor Thornton and Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. Sims, and I'm sorry to be slow on this or thick. Uh, inundation mapping study, Mr. Sims. Just what exactly <laughs> does that? We were all wondering. What does that tell us or show us? Well, um, it's a, it's yes. part of. And Mr. Squires here as well is our manager of water resources. He can speak to a lot of Well, somebody please. Yeah, but I, 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 can, I can fill in that. I just wanted to acknowledge. You can come up, Mike. Uh, the, um, so this is part of our dam safety reviews. We need to ensure that uh, to, to determine what the consequences of a failure, not necessarily chance of a failure, but what are the consequences, no matter how well built the dam is, if it were to fail. So this is for both our Jump Creek and South Fork dams. If they were to fail, what would happen? We have some very old mapping, and so this is really updating the area of inundation, and that sort of informs our emergency plan. And if I may follow up, thank you, that's very helpful. Would this work then tie in with sort of a case study for uh, increasing the height of the dam? It's a good question. Thank you, Your Worship. This is really about the the dam safety, or the safety of the existing dam, I should say. Uh, it, it is all sort of integrated, uh, but increasing the height would be sort of the growth, the growth consideration, and that's one of actually council's strategic uh, directions is to increase the, or to look at the water supply strategic plan update. That's a separate issue. That's purely with increasing supply. This particular study will help us determine what the risks or the, the consequences of the Sorry, if I might add, Mr. Um, Chair. Um, yes, part of the scope of work will include the updated additional height for the dam and the breach for that dam, proposed height for the dam. So it will include that. Good. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Any further questions? Councillor Bonner. Thank you. Um, and three to staff. Um, the uh, this thing's being bumped up two years, and I quite like the idea of things being done two years early. Um, is this going to be particularly done through staff, or are you using outside consultants to do the work? Yes, through Mr. Chair, this will be uh, we're going out with a request for proposal for a consultant who an expert in dam breach study analysis and flood inundation. But for the most part, I'm currently writing terms of reference for the proposal. Councillor Turley. Thank you, Worship. Um, so, give, if, if the study shows that there's damage being done to private property downstream, is that information going to be shared with the groups of the private property? I'm thinking of insurance issues. Yes, uh, through Mr. Chair. That will be uh, part of the terms of reference. We're developing a stakeholder uh, group identified in the downstream inundation study. Uh, once that study is complete and adopted by council, then it becomes a public. And I take it in fairness that that kind of information will be shared with Chief Fry and everyone who works with her in terms of what their expectations might be around disaster management if and when such a horrible thing occurred. Any further questions? The motion, please. There, there is. Oh, we, uh, they don't have any motion. Oh, pardon me. Yes. The uh, recommendation. Yes. Second, Councillor Hammonds. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Mr. Sims, Esplanade Water Main Replacement Project. Thank you, Your Worship. This is simply an information report. Um, this is just advising council. Uh, that we will be shuffling a little bit of money around for the water main replacement project on Esplanade that uh, its cost was higher than originally budgeted in the current year. Uh, there's a few bullet points, so some additional project management effort. 
but uh, most notably I would say the archaeological and as is often the case in downtown and old city areas, there's sort of surprise, surprises you find on the ground, and that was the case on this one. The uh, conscious of the fact that we're often in front of you saying, oh, this project is over budget, that project is over budget, we need more money, uh, but we propose to, in the near future and, and then ongoing on a regular basis, bring you sort of a, an overview report that says, you know, Here's how, here's how our cost estimate, or here's how our budgets were, and here's how the actual programs. Um, Mr. Stewart did an analysis earlier this year just to kind of test our cost estimating, and we were within, within 1% of you know, over and under inches. So we just like to make that information public and help uh, Council's confidence in, in our project management staff. Dr. Armstrong? Move the recommendation. Seconded. Councillor Thurk. Any discussion? Just to receive information, Councillor Brown. I'm just curious where this project is occurring. I've gone the, the scope of the, you know, the result in, is going to result in traffic closures or things like that? We uh, have actually. It, it's, it's done pretty okay. much. It's, it's right. from the A and W on Victoria across in front of Salvation Army and around the corner. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, on to other business. We have correspondence from the Innovative Young Indigenous Leaders Symposium uh, requesting funding for lunch for 60 participants, $1,319.18. Councillor Brown? Uh, yes, I requested that the clerk's office be placed on the agenda um, for consideration. However, due to the timing, there's no way this could have council approval before the actual event, so I won't be proposing much. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Worship. I guess my, and I think it's still relevant, my question regarding this would be where does it fit with our policy and our system of city grants and event grants and so on? Could it be referred down that channel? So, Ms. Curry. Um, thank you, Worship. So, matters of a financial um, nature, um, requests for finances, et cetera, would come to the Finance and Audit Committee, which is why um, when we had the request for this correspondence. It's to this meeting rather than a council meeting. Um, and then staff look into if council was to propose this, where the money would come from, and um, if the budget money, if the amount was available. Obviously, there is this amount available, and finance staff have looked into what budget should council propose this, where it would come from, etc. So this is the avenue and the process for these types of requests. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Ms. Curie, I had mentioned to you um, previously yes. that we might fire a message going camera this morning. Would this be the appropriate time? Um, or so shall we'll, we deal with question period first? I think first? we should um, um, do, uh, go to question period first, and then if there's a procedural motion that we need to go on camera for, we will deal with that after question period. And do you we do have one question? Um, Certainly. Thank you. Mr. Barclay, budget discussion workshop five. Hey. Uh, two, two questions. The first, uh, quantitative, and the second, qualitative. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it says in the uh, workshop documents that the council is to provide direction on their priorities and expectations for the financial plan. And I understand this is just the beginning of this, this process. But what, what I didn't didn't hear, and I was hoping to hear, um, was something about numbers. Now, I'll note, based on your budget document, the last year's budget, um, the expenditures went up 6.4%. Property taxes supposed to be 5%. Mine actually went up 6.2% in my house, which is kind of par for the course. It's the total tax increase a little bit higher. But what I didn't hear from council was, well, what is your bottom line? And I think staff needs this direction. Are you prepared to, to see property taxes go up 5%, 6%? Right now it's su suggesting 3.6%, plus if the Port, uh, the port Theatre uh, expansion goes ahead, that becomes 4.6%. There's not a lot of money to play with there. So that's, that's what I'm asking is, 
what what are your ideas about well, what is the bottom line? How high can you go? Do you want to stick to this 3.6, which might be 4.6, or would you go to 5.6? Councillors Armstrong and then Emmons. I can't answer that right now because I need to see what the priorities are. I mean, uh, like right now, we, have, we know we're at 3.6 to maintain our, our services. There could be a catastrophe or something happens, so I can't answer that. I, I always want to keep them down low, but I also want to see quality of service. So that's my answer right now. I'm not in a position right now until I see more reports from staff and what the cost will be. Like for me, there may be some projects that go, like um, the rest of the trail may be put on hold for me because it's going to cost too much in this budget for all so, But right now, I, I'm not prepared to answer that until I get more uh, stuff. Like I would like to keep it low, under four, which still seems high to people, but you know. Okay, well, that, that's a priority. That's, yeah, that's what I'm asking yeah, for. That, so. that for me, yeah, thank you. Councillor Hemmons? <laughs> you look like you're wanting to say something. I'll, I'll echo Councillor uh, Councillor Armstrong and say that for me, the priority is setting what do we want to do, and then looking at the numbers. And and I don't, like Councillor Armstrong, I don't have a, a number that I'm looking to achieve. It's really what service, what service levels are we looking to achieve, and then negotiating what I, you know, would hope would be a, a palatable tax. Second question. My second question, and this is the more qualitative question, um, and I'm a little bit afraid that I see history repeating itself. So you have this meeting and this talk. I don't know you're going to have another another meeting. And I know the previous council had a full day session where they developed their ideas. They put sticky notes up, and these were their top five uh, projects. And miraculously, we had an event center that came out of this. I don't know how that happened. And so my question is, what has your community engagement told you about what the community wants in terms of dream projects or wish lists? I've been looking for that. Again, this is just the beginning of the process, but I'm hoping that your ideas are what the community wants, not just what you want. Councillor Brown. Yes, if I may, Your Worship, uh, I think it's important to highlight that we adopted a strategic plan that has some items that had robust community consultation. I believe the waterfront walkway was had the most responses and positive responses in sort of recent uh, um, city history. So I think that the premise of the question, um, you know, really we're looking, this is like a snapshot of one year, not necessarily um, community preferences. Uh, um, so, you know, we're talking about service levels and, and those sort of things. It's a little bit different than uh, going out to the community and saying, what is your wish list of projects? A lot of that has already been done and it's included in the existing plans. Um, and then in addition, you know, I think there was reference to uh, two major planning processes, the official community plan and the facilities master plan, that really do start to identify service levels, but also existing uh, potential future capital projects that the, the community may be interested in, you know, whether it is building something in a currently underserviced area that I think most of us know intuitively, but uh, that is a question that doesn't go to the community. So, um, uh, you know, I don't think there was real discussion about huge projects here that necessarily warrant uh, going out to the community's consultation. And, uh, you know, your concern obviously I think is founded based on some history, but uh, I don't think there was any discussion at the table today that uh, sort of reflects that history. Ms. Gray. Um, thank you, Worship. Just through you to the delegation, Mr. Markley, um, and just one further point that than what Councillor Brown made is the um, the event center priority. Um, that was also in a, in a closed council session, and the strategic plan priorities by this council have all been an open session, and there's been the ability for um, the public to engage and, and um, participate in council's decision making. I think I'll conclude with this in response to your question, Mr. Barclay, or your, or your suggestion or the implication of your question. Um, uh, there's a reason 80% of Nanaimo's voters voted against the uh, proposed event center, and there's a reason all these fresh faces are sitting around the council, so I think you can rest a little easier tonight. Thank you. That concludes question period. Um, I would appreciate now a procedural motion. Um, so thank you, Worship. Um, from my understanding, um, we are looking for a procedural motion from Councillor to um, proceed in general under sections 91C and 91N of the Community Charter. Seconder. Councillor Turley. Thank you.
favor? Would it work? So we are now in camera for in camera finance knowledge. I'll publish never to bring up money again. I don't think. We're actually going to make a, a video.